Hello, and welcome to the first webinar in a series of virtual events coordinated by the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy and the Institute for Human Rights. Throughout the semester, we will explore topics around racial justice and police reform. We wanted to start with the history of Birmingham, why and how the city was founded, and what policies were implemented to keep poor people and Black people from equality. We believe that understanding our city's past will help us shape its future. So welcome, Dr. King, to PUH 322 ENH 615. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Allen. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to this. I'm uh, Pam King, and um, I just retired from the history department at UAB. Um, and just real quickly, um, I, I've had the good fortune to have a, a dual career in both academics um, in the history department, but also as a hands-on practitioner of, of historic preservation. And so it was uh, through really my work as historic preservation that I became so um, intimately familiar with the neighborhoods and the places that make up Birmingham. So I just wanted to say that. Um, the way I uh, like to think of the city of Birmingham and its founding is that it was built perfectly to match what the founders had in mind. And so for a long time, I've understood that Birmingham wasn't an outlier. It wasn't an aberration. It wasn't a thing gone wrong. It was in fact founded and worked exactly as its um, visionaries saw it. And so for that reason, I call it the perfect city. Um, it was built strictly for production and profit. And what I mean by that is that Birmingham and I think virtually all of the cities uh, post-Civil War um, had no high-blown ideals other than making money. That was it. There was no notion about uh, religious freedom or city upon a hill or any of that stuff. Birmingham was built for one reason and one reason only, and that was to make a lot of money for the people who own the economic system. The Birmingham founders uh, then, which was really a group of 10 men, um, Southerners, uh, built Birmingham from scratch. What a wonderful thing, right? When you can start something from scratch, you can do it any way you want to do it. Um, and so they had no old systems to take down. They didn't have any old South traditions. They didn't have any plantation systems to take down. They didn't have to dismantle farms. They didn't have to do anything because there was virtually nothing here in Jefferson County. So it was a, a, a vacant palette and the founders could do with it what they wanted. What they built was exactly what they had in mind. And it reflected their values and the highest values of the United States. Birmingham was built in 1871, which is at the height of the Reconstruction era. Reconstruction, if you remember, begins at the end of the Civil War and ends formally in 1877. So, this uh, city in 1871 was built at the height of the Reconstruction era and at the beginning of the so-called New South. Birmingham, named after the industrial city in England, had no Old South uh, traditions. It had no broken down slave system. It had no ruptured um, plantation system, it had no cotton fields that had to be undone. There was nothing here. It had to spend no time deconstructing old systems um, or old traditions. What they did have is a whole lot of knowledge about exactly what kind of mineral riches were right under the ground. It wasn't though until the Civil War is over the South has lost. Um, slavery will be dismantled in a way um, that, 
and that the, and the country or the South is looking for new capital and new money and new resources, is it gonna be time to build this new city? Perfect timing. And, and because of those uh, world-class geological surveys and maps, uh, Birmingham founders knew exactly how they needed to go down there and get this stuff out. It was said that Birmingham was the only place in the world that had all five ingredients necessary to make pig iron within a five mile radius. This is a jack pot. And so what they seek to do is to build this wonderful New South city. Well, what were the uh, values that were so predominant and idolized and modern in the United States after the Civil War? Well, for one thing, it's unfettered capitalism. Unfettered capitalism means that there are no regulations. There are no federal standards. There's no OSHA. There are no minimum wages. There are no safety standards. There's no income tax. The idea being that the United States is going to be the place where individuals um, and corporations do whatever they need to do, however they need to do it, to build big, 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 big money. The United States' goal is to become a world player, and it does. How do they do that? They're gonna build the biggest unregulated capitalistic system in the world. In the United States, we refer to that as the Gilded Age. So the Gilded Age is that period after the Civil War, and really after 1877, when Reconstruction formally ends, when the United States puts into place all of the systems required to big, big, build big money, big private capital, and all without any regulation. That's the whole idea. One of the things that um, evolves out of this it is a handful of individuals, white men, who uh, earn the name robber barons. Uh, this is a nickname given to these uber capitalists, people like Carnegie and Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan, who have more money than God and uh, from the point of view, increasingly by the late 1800s, they didn't earn all that. They stole it. So increasingly, critics uh, are saying these people have robbed us blind. And they refer to them as robber barons. But who cares if you're a robber baron? They can't do anything to you because the federal government and corporate po policies are completely in sync. Well, how do you know? Well, I know because in the uh, late 1800s, there was a landmark Supreme Court decision. We still hear about it now. It's more, it's as important now as it was 120 years ago. And that Supreme Court said um, that, guess what? Corporations are individuals. That means that corporations can have freedom of speech. They have the protection of due process. That means that corporations are gonna be protected from the federal government interfering with them. And they have the right to bear arms. That's cool, right? And we're gonna see this played out big time in Birmingham. They're going to be like individuals. They're going to be as sacred as any other individual, except, of course, that they have all the money, too. A second um, ideology, a, a philosophy that was so prevalent was called social Darwinism. And you may have heard this referred to as survival of the fittest. Social Darwinism was a social and economic philosophy that was especially popular in the United States 
And the philosophers who really um, uh, advocated for this philosophy and developed it came out of, guess what? Ivy League universities. Of course they did. They come out of the most prestigious Ivy League, upper crust, elitist universities in the country. These don't come out of hard scrabble community colleges in Walker County. These come out of Ivy League universities. Well, what did it say? Well, it said that uh, since Darwin, Charles Darwin developed the uh, scientific theory, they said, that only the fittest species survive, that ought to be applied to um, societies. That means that in a social setting, only those people that are fit to survive do survive, right? So social Darwinism is a very hard edge philosophy. It says if you're poor, it's your own fault. If you're rich, it's because you're supposed to be rich. God wants it that way. Nature wants it that way. You can't interfere with that. It was a system that uh, uh, absolutely sanctified the establishment exactly where it was. Well, that's gonna fit in really well with Booker T. Washington's philosophy. And Booker T. Washington's philosophy is very enlightened during this period. It's not a backward philosophy, but when he uh, develops his philosophy, it's very enlightened and a sure a lot better than the slave philosophy. The slave philosophy had said that black people were born to do hard labor for white people. That's what it said. Booker T. Washington's enlightened theory says, no, 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 wait a minute. If we build trade schools, if we educate black people to learn a trade, then they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and uh, become a professional, become, um, ha have a skill, a trade. That's very different and modern and enlightened than the old slave attitudes, which didn't believe black people capable of any industrial work. And he's saying, uh, he's saying to white people, really, don't worry about us. We're not gonna look to bother you. We're not gonna look to interfere with you. Just take your heel off our necks. Let us get an education and you will find that we can succeed. And so what better fit for this new city that uh, has been founded in Birmingham, but to also have this new modern philosophy that black people can work in industry. They can succeed in industry. They don't have to be uh, uh, pigeonholed in some broken down farm somewhere in the Black Belt. Put those two together, and then at the end of the century, you've got another Supreme Court decision that just sets the whole country on its way. And that's called the famous Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which comes out of a situation in New Orleans. What the Ferguson, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson decision says, and again, it comes out of the U.S. Supreme Court, not the Montgomery, not the Alabama Supreme Court, not the Supreme Court in Jackson, Mississippi, not Atlanta. This isn't a Deep South decision. This is a U.S. Supreme Court decision that says, okay, now in 1896, we tried this whole construction thing, there's a lot of violence, this and that and the other, and we've decided now that uh, segregation is okay and legal. Segregation is legal, protected by the Constitution, and um, it applies to the whole country. And so what you're going to see 
what you're going to get is what you uh, hoped for if you were uh, white and establishment, which is that now cities, states all over the country can put in Jim Crow segregation ordinances out the wazoo, which they do. Every single state in the union had them. One quick qu uh, thing about Jim Crow is that it starts in the North prior to the Civil War. It's in these Northern pre-Civil War cities that they, quote, needed racial segregation. You don't need uh, racial segregation in the slave South. The slave South has slavery. You don't need any uh, Jim Crow ordinances. And so this, uh, these Jim Crow ordinances migrate from the North to the South. Birmingham's population, um, and this graph shows it real, it, it, Birmingham is an absolute unmitigated boom town. Its population just absolutely goes through the roof really quickly. It's growing and it's bigger than Atlanta, bigger than New Orleans, bigger than silly old Nashville, bigger than any of them, growing like wildfire. Something they're doing is work, working. The population of Birmingham in the 1880s and 1890s, by the turn of the century, 35% were native born white, 20% were European immigrants, mainly from Germany, Italy, Poland, Russia. Birmingham is diverse. Atlanta doesn't have this. They don't have these factories and mines and mills. Nashville doesn't have them. Chattanooga's got them. But we're going to stomp the heck out of them. So Birmingham is a very diverse city. You name it. They were in Birmingham. They weren't in these other southern cities. The rest, some 45% were black. Either they had come up from the Black Belt, that means the south part of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, or they were convicts, at least from the state of Alabama. I'm gonna go back to that um, in just a minute. Someone big. Now, I don't care who you are, those are big houses. If you look up at the Vulcan statue and you see those mansions right on the bridge there, those are the mansions I'm talking about. The one on the right, which is the Swan House. Those mansions up on the ridge are what I'm talking about. Those are big, big houses. And to this day, you need to know how to get up there to get up there, or you're just gonna be going around in circles. Very exclusive. When the Swan House on the right was built, it was the largest house in the state of Alabama. The house on the left of the screen is the Massey residence. And it is where the old um, Western supermarket on Highland Avenue was. Most, of course, are not going to make it rich. Birmingham is going to be, uh, be made up of a series of what a lot of people come to call iron plantations. Where does that model come from? Well, it doesn't come from Mississippi. It comes from New England, late 1700s, when the first uh, mills were built in the United States. That's the model. These factories, that's the model Southern, Southerners are going to use. These were very draconian uh, places in the late 1700s, early 1800s. They were rough. People. Uh, uh, the factory managers used whips on people. This is no place you want to be. Well, if you combine the industrial aspect of those early mills up in New England with the plantation ideals of the South, put those together and look at your screen on the right. That's what you get. And so some people call those iron plantations. 
the factory plant is simply a shortened word for plantation. Birmingham was almost uniquely um, built around individual corporations and the company towns they built. So the corporations built the towns. They built Fairfield. They built Inslee. They built these neighborhoods. They owned them. They owned the land. They owned the houses. They owned the smokestacks. And they owned you. On the, on the upper right uh, is a very famous uh, photograph. And look at that. Those, a lot of things are going on there. The South is just out of, just barely a step or two away from an agricultural state. The cow's still there. But look at those houses there, right jam up against those uh, industrial stacks. There were no laws re regulating that. So what? The bottom slide uh, is an armed corporate man. He's looking for union sympathizers and he better not find you. All of these companies, the big ones, uh, TCI, which became U.S. Steel, they all had their own police forces. They didn't use city police. They weren't in the city limits, generally. They used their own police forces. They had their own armed guards. They had machine gun nests. And what they're looking for is union. The uh, photograph at the bottom um, is probably, we think, of mining camps in the Ishkuda area. Um, we know the Ishkuda area. Uh, it's certainly a mining camp. There were white mining camps and black mining camps. They look for all the world exactly the same, but make no mistake, there's a world of difference between the way white people are treated and black people are treated and everyone knows it. A big source of labor all over the South and outside the South are convicts. And boy, is that a jackpot for these companies. How in the world, you notice I put legally up there, perfectly legal, how so? The 13th Amendment outlawed slavery. Everybody knows that, except you could not, uh, it was illegal to have um, forced labor, except for convicts. All right, now we can work with that, all right? So in 1866, the state of Alabama, followed by virtually everybody else, is gonna pass a law called the Tenancy Act. And so that, that state law, the state of Alabama, the right to arrest you if you're a vagrant. Vagrancy Act, I'm sorry, I said tenancy. I meant Vagrancy Act. If you're a vagrant, well, how do you know if you're a vagrant? Well, if you don't have papers saying where you were, you're a vagrant. The Vagrancy Act was aimed directly at the forehead of black people. If you didn't have papers, well, you could either pay a fine of $5, I think. Nobody, poor white or poor black, have $5. Nobody's got $5. Or you could go to prison and work it off. Well, that's a no-brainer. You're going to prison to work it off. So from the point of view of the state of Alabama, this is a jackpot. The state of Alabama after the Civil War is awfully poor. It doesn't have any income. S uh, former slave owners have lost their property. They need workers. And those corporations really need workers. It's horrifying. It's brutal. And if you can imagine it, probably more exploited than slavery. So you're a black man or a woman, the state of Alabama arrests you. The corporations 
uh, send a note to the governor. Governor, we're down in uh, Birmingham. We're running the Pratt Mines and we need 300 new workers by next Saturday. Send them to us. Why do I say it could be more exploited? Because slave owners purchased slaves. They put money into these people. They had investments in them. They clothed them, fed them, maybe not well, but they put money into these people. They don't want their investments to die, some did, but that isn't the point of it. Convicts are completely disposable. No one's got an investment in them, who cares? Many of these convicts died where they fell and their graves are scattered all over the place in Jefferson County and other places. In, Tro in Pratt uh, City, uh, the TCI, Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, which became U.S. Steel, uh, there's still a uh, convict uh, cemetery in Pratt City. Not easy to find, but it's there. They're all the place though. Families were uh, rarely um, notified. So the state is getting income from the corporations who lease them, and the corporations now have absolutely controlled labor and as cheap as it could possibly be completely disposable. One dies, give the governor a ring, get some more. It's pretty much that simple, it really is. Birmingham thrived, and by the 1890s, it was known as the magic city. Look at that, from nothing to this. Their philosophy must be working. The vision that the founders had is played out right here. By the, uh, uh, during the night, by the end of the 1920s, this corner you see, can you see these four big uh, skyscrapers are built. The first one starts in 1902. The last one, the John Hand building right there is finished in the late 1920s. Collectively, this becomes uh, known as the heaviest corner on earth. It is a testament Look at those modern skyscrapers. Come on, you're not gonna see anything better than that in Chicago or anywhere else. It's modern skyscrapers, all of them headquarters of industrial companies or the banks that supply them. In 1925, a US Supreme Court decision out of California is gonna make it legal to zone according to use. Well, that's a real quick leap to zone for whatever you want to zone for. And so cities all over the country following the Supreme Court decision began to create neighborhood zones that on the surface had to do with use, in other words, industrial neighborhoods, commercial districts, this sort of thing. But it also happened to overlap with race, overlap with race. This is the map of, of Birmingham. I think this was in 42, but the original one in 1926 looks almost just like it. So now we're going to lay another layer on top of restricting neighborhoods by race, so that uh, black folks and poor whites, but black folks especially, are gonna get to live only in the industrial neighborhoods, right next to the smokestacks. And they're not gonna be able to live in any other place. It's not that they don't want to, is that they cannot go there. Well, what's the big deal? Why not just get up and defy this silliness and move on to somewhere else? Because it doesn't work that way. And I'm gonna show you that. Um, I know there was some 
mentioned about redlining, mm -hmm. uh, which is in the in the uh, the ethos now. Um, and so, if you've got neighborhoods that are zoned, color coded for map purposes, then banks too can draw red lines around the neighborhoods they will lend to and neighborhoods they won't lend to. They won't lend to black neighborhoods. So they draw essentially a red line around them, perfectly legal to do until it's not. All of this is legal to do until it's not. And so black people cannot get resources to amount to much. Birmingham is notoriously hard-fisted. It's a notoriously hard place if you're poor and if you're, and if you're black. Why is it so notorious? Why is it so hard here? Because it's got layers and layers and layers of restriction, one set on top of the other, all perfectly legal, that put these barriers intentionally in place to keep black people, especially, from advancing. This is a very fragile thing, they think, which is that if if the corporations don't drive a wedge through their white workers and their black workers, what if those few families up on the ridge we talked about in those mansions, there are not many of them. There are not many of these uber capitalists. What happens, they worry, if white workers and black workers ever see themselves in the same boat. We're done. They will come after us. They will join unions together and God help us then. We will not be able to control this system. And so racism is an intentional wedge on top of all of its long history. It's a wedge that is powerfully important to these corporations. So what are these layers? State laws, we talked about that since 1866. Convict uh, lease labor is gonna be legal until 1927 when the Supreme Court uh, uh, decides to outlaw it. Alabama is going to be the last state to uh, outlaw it on a state level. There's so much at stake. And remember, Alabama is so dang poor. If the state can't get that income from the corporations, where on earth is it going to get income? Federal law. Not only the Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision, but a whole slew of other Supreme Court decisions in the late 1800s. The one that said corporations were individuals. They can carry weapons. You got those armed guards. They can do anything they want because they are sacred as an individual. Other Supreme Court decisions late 1800s, said things like, well, the federal government can't regulate uh, what goes on, let's say, with state organizations. Let's say the Ku Klux Klan. It's not sanctioned by the federal government. So the federal government in the late 1800s is going to say, we have no authority to deal with the Ku Klux Klan. It's up to Mississippi to deal with the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, right. It's up to Alabama. It's up to Oregon. Oregon's got the Klan. 
it's up to states to regulate the Klan. Well, how in the world are they gonna do that when the state is the Klan? But the federal government, late 1800s, makes it clear, it ain't dealing with any of that. You do what you want, states. It's also gonna uh, decide, late 1800s, that yes, black men, you are guaranteed the vote, the right to vote, but we can't guarantee that you can actually use it. That's not our business. That's the state's business. Lots of conversation in the last 10, 20 years right now about state efforts to suppress the vote. Those Supreme Court decisions uh, make it easy for the federal government to say, hey, you know, we hope the state of Georgia is going to do the right thing, but that's sort of their problem. So you've got these federal laws that are going to be in place. And then Birmingham, boy, the corporations, their own police force, their own machine gun nest, they own everything about you. They will kill you if they find you talking to them. Okay, uh, so um, I think we got all through that. I was talking about the different layers, which you can see there. It's just layer upon layer upon layer. And so if you're wondering how blacks and poor whites were so uh, locked down I hope you can see that there were so many layers of barriers, one on top of the other, all perfectly legal and enforceable by force. Either put you in jail, beat you up, fire you, whatever. The Great Depression, the Communist Party, a great war, World War II, plastics, and a whole lot of labor unions pushed the perfect city, Birmingham, towards certain collapse. What do I mean by that? The Great Depression, this is a one industry town. The whole economy is uh, rest, is dependent on uh, the mills and the mines, the, the furnaces and the mines. If they get wobbly, Birmingham goes out. The Great Depression, uh, the, 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 the railroads and manufacturing did get wobbly and worse. And so a city like Birmingham is going to, um, some say was the worst hit city of the entire Great Depression. The Communist Party, Birmingham had the largest Communist Party in the South. If you remember the Russian Revolution in 1917 was the first successful communist revolution. And, um, and so that scared the Dickens out of every Western country, every capitalistic country, um, and what the Communist Party stood for real generally was that they believed that capitalism by its very nature was exploitive of workers. In 1929, the Communist Party of the South, in the South, Southern headquarters moved from Chattanooga to Birmingham. The, the historian of this is a, a man who was at Berkeley, I'm not sure where he is now, named Robin Kelly. His book, Hammer and Ho, one of my very favorite things, specifically and only on communism in Alabama. And he's the one that says categorically that it was black women, and he used the word backbone, were the backbone of the Communist Party in Birmingham. Southerners created this whole new brand of communism that blended religion, organized religion, and communism. The, the war, World War II, there's a lot been done about this, but when black soldiers come back to the South and there's still Jim Crow, is another impetus for black people to have the confidence, the courage, and now some money in their pockets, their vets to uh, be able to organize against the system. In addition to that, plastics were overtaking American iron and steel, Birmingham iron and steel. The markets were going out. The big corporations were moving to South America. 
where they're not going to have to contend with these dang unions. And so at the same time, Birmingham is becoming more empowered inside itself, learning to organize it, learning to get the message across, learning to think in terms of economic exploitation. Combine that with the newly empowered veteran class coming back, and at the same time, the big corporations here on their own looking somewhere else, starting to pull out. And then you've got the unions the very thing that the corporations knew would be their death knell. Alabama went from having the least labor unions before World War II to having the most after World War II. You combine these things together and the perfect system for Birmingham isn't gonna be so perfect anymore. And then that puts us right to uh, the early civil rights movement. And I'll stop there, because that's a whole other thing. But my thinking was to understand how Birmingham worked, how it operated, why it was such a tough nut, and how it is so much like Chicago and other cities that still, still don't know they're more similar to Birmingham than not. And I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you for that really enlightening presentation, Dr. Dr. King. I wanted to um, open up the, the chat as well as just people can certainly come off mute if necessary um, to ask questions. There was a question that came through Dr. King a little bit earlier in your presentation in the chat um, you had mentioned a particular Supreme Court case. You talked about um, Plessy versus Ferguson in this right. particular slide, but there was another that you had referenced earlier in that, in this, yep. in this same one. And can about you just- the corporations? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I believe it was in 1883. And, okay. and I apologize for not having the name on the tip of my tongue, but uh, I believe it was in 1883. And so, if you Googled uh, landmark Supreme Court decisions 1883, I think you'd pull it right up. Hi, I, had, I was the one that had a question about the Supreme Court case um, for 1883. And I was wondering if that precedent was still in place and that's how corporations are viewed. And if there are protections against those rights that are conferred by treating them like individuals. Yeah, well, you know, and I'm not a constitutional scholar. But you know, the Supreme Court decision of just a few years ago, which allowed during political campaigns, corporations can donate as much money as they want because they are considered individuals. And, and so I would say that that's a direct link, uh, I believe it is, from that Supreme Court decision. So whereas individuals can only donate certain amounts to campaigns, corporations can, because they have so many resources, but if they're viewed just as an individual, well, they could give, you know, millions and millions of dollars just as an individual. There's a, a, another Supreme Court decision that fascinates me. I, I believe it's called Morris versus Alabama, uh, 1947. And uh, what it said, uh, it was kind of the beginning of the end, I think, for these company towns, because that decision had to, it was a case coming out of Mobile, and it had to do with, I think it was Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who were uh, uh, handing out information inside one of the company towns in Mobile. They had these big shipping company towns. And the corporations uh, were very uh, attuned to religious stuff like that because some religions they viewed as really good, a good fit for, um, for their interests. But some, some religions they didn't. They viewed as being too emotional, too defiant, too individual. And so they went after these Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Jehovah's Witnesses sued them. And the Supreme Court 
uh, ruling said that the corporation, the company, towns, the corporations could not suppress freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and that sort of thing. And it's a landmark because it penetrated now. This impenetrable wall corporations had around them that said they could do any dang thing they wanted to do. And uh, I believe it had a super big impact on the corporations in Alabama and other places. But then, um, uh, other things are going to supersede. So you, when the civil rights laws come into place, uh, 63, 64, 65, for instance, the corporations can't tell you you don't have the right to vote, not after 1965. So in answer to your questions, the corporations still are viewed as an individual, but these, there are other decisions that take precedence over that civil rights uh, uh, laws and decisions, for instance. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Keene, this is Dr. Allen. I, there are a couple of things that really just stood out to me in your presentation that you mentioned, and I just kind of want to highlight and recap. First of all, is that Birmingham had all of the five ingredients needed um, to make pig iron within a five mile radius. And yeah. in this class, we've been talking about, honestly, some of these, in, of these iron plantations, some of these large landfills in um, the state, and how Alabama, unfortunately, um, has, is and, and continues to be the dumping ground for a lot of other states' um, waste. And uh, what I think is interesting is that, you know, Birmingham was this rich, source mm. of of material in order to make this you know steel basically pig iron we, we we know that there are lots of steel mills and like you said very similar to the midwest um so they were they're creating all of this pollution they're they're keeping people in place through redlining um right. they are someone had mentioned in the chat you know it's just crazy that these corporations have their own police forces and ways of kind of controlling and containing people right. from moving forward and yet this is still a very poor state um yes. That's at right. the same time. So we, we've been talking about a lot of this in terms of systems and how they've been designed to really right. keep people, particularly low income communities of color, those who don't have a lot of political power, keeping right. them, you know, in in place. And I think right. you just set up the really just kind of the context of this course by talking about, you know, it's rich in, a, in, in one way, it's rich in resources, but then it's very poor in decision making, it's poor in how, right. you know, how these laws and policies are put, in, put into place right. to really keep people at a disadvantage. And right. I think, and, th and that, that kind of context um, is overlaid in the environmental justice conversation Right. All the time. All, yeah. All the you, time. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and if you don't have if you don't have the political power spread out, you know, if, if people don't exercise their political power or don't know they have any political power or somehow just don't get access to the system, then you've still got those handful of people up on the ridge figuratively speaking, controlling all the levers. Yeah, so, so Alabama is so especially poor in uh, the disbursement, maybe that's the word, of, of, of political access, political power, mm -hmm. uh, because of poverty. So those people who, who live, you know, right on those dumping grounds or right next to them, there's no mechanism, there's no systematic effort to get them to the political to political access obviously they want to keep them out of political access right because they can do damage politically right yeah exactly if they ever exactly. do mobilize yeah right throughout the presentation i mean you kind of 
you mentioned unions a lot. Um, <laughs> and that's, I feel like that's not necessarily a piece of Southern history that a lot of people are familiar with. So I was wondering if you could uh, maybe just give some more background on like what what unions were at the time, what that looked like, and why corporations were so afraid of unions and wanted to stamp down any sort of labor movement like that. Okay, well, basically the only thing standing between corporations and collective bargaining or collective action against their policies would be for the workers to organize and unionize. And uh, so from their point of view, certainly keeping unions out was the number one priority. So the South was especially anti-union. The political system was so top down. It was such a poor part of the country, less progressive ideas could circulate at all. And so the South was historically the least unionized. So it was a very controlled environment. The companies understood that if they did not prevent their workers from organizing, they could not get away with the kind of policies they got away with. And so one thing I said about the unions that's so important to Birmingham is that uh, Alabama was uh, the least unionized state prior to World War II, but the most unionized state after World War II. And so during the war was a great opportunity because the, the manufactured goods were so critical to the war. And so much of those manufactured goods were being produced right in Birmingham. But laborers were, and unions themselves were able to make great inroads. Uh, these unions were strong and powerful, and of course, they, they taught uh, laborers to organize, as did, as I said, the Communist Party. So they, they were a, a critical piece, and that's why those armed guards and the machine gun nests um, were so implemented, not just in the South, but all over the country. That really does help. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And then there, there's one other question, and I'm going to let this one be the last one because we were right at almost at our, our time. Um, this came in from Cameron, who asks, do you think that, there, that these systems in Birmingham, these things that we've talked about, kind of these political powerless systems, these, these systems of keeping people in place, do you think that those systems in Birmingham contribute to the current gentrification of Birmingham now? Could you speak to that? And then we'll let that be our last question before we end. Well, you know, systems die hard, right? <laughs> they, they die hard. And while Birmingham still has some industry, some manufacturing, beginning in the late 40s and certainly uh, early 60s, Birmingham and Alabama's dominant employer is UAB. So we switched completely from a blue collar town to a white collar, collar service town. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to keep that in mind that these corporations don't wield that kind of power anymore. Uh, but the systems, the residual systems are still in place, uh, 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 meaning that they are generational, right? That, that you can't just wave wands and the social and political systems that are, and economic systems that are created you know, out of a hundred years are suddenly going to go away. I, I was at a fascinating conference I've attended. I attended a, quite a few. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's African-American state and local history. I think it is um, conference. It's a national conference. And I gave a presentation one time um, and, and so attended the conference. And one of the several of the meetings were about generational, um, the, the, the psychological, what I'm trying to say, generational effects on African Americans. You know, that again, these things are embedded and ingrained in neighborhoods, in schools, in families, in individuals. It gets so embedded and ingrained that it's so hard to find a way out of it. It, it just becomes so generational. And, and, and so the, the, the residual systemic stuff is still there. So does it contribute to 
gentrification. Yeah. That's a issue, you know, all over the country. Birmingham isn't unusual in that or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, gentrification is when the powerless don't have enough power to live where they want to live. Right. And people with voices can move them out if they want to. Capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been absolutely enlightening, really informative. Thank you so much, Dr. King, for your presentation on the history of Birmingham. I know we have students who are from the area who may not have known about, you know, this convict cemetery in Pratt City or not mm -hmm. really understood kind of some of the big industrial types of systems that have, that have been built um, and still exist. In, in place, we know we we're talking about North Birmingham quite a bit in this yeah. class right. and it being a super fun site and where some of those large Coke plants are located and what that right. area and demographic looks like. So this has been quite helpful in terms of just providing some overlay and context for things that we'll be continuing to discuss in the class. So just to echo Dr. Allen really quick and, um, and to close us out, History is fascinating. Birmingham is fascinating. I've, yeah. I've really made this, this city my home. And yeah. I, really, I really appreciate looking at like this, this big picture, systemic view of, of history and how, um, as, you were, as you've talked about this whole time, how you know, these, these policies that were in place at the founding of our city, you know, 140 years ago, they still affect us today, even though they're not necessarily codified, even though they're not textually legal anymore. You know, the, as you said in your presentation, you can't just wave a wand yeah. and say, okay, everything's fixed now. We, we're still dealing with the repercussions of these policies today. Right.